Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object Podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of Automated Creative, and this is a podcast about the future of marketing. Every week or so, I have the pleasure and the privilege of interviewing one of our industry's leaders, and this week is no different. We have Luis Spencer Freitas, who is Director of Omnichannel and CRM at Moet Hennessy LBMH USA. Luis, uh, we met a couple of years ago and it's great to have you on the podcast. Could we just have a little introduction to you and who you are and what you do for people who haven't met you or seen many of your brilliant LinkedIn posts? <laughs> hey, Tom. Um, so, hey, I'm, Lu- I'm, like Tom said, Luis Spencer Freitas, Director of Omnichannel CRM at LBMH. Um, I've been working, I think if you sum up my career very quickly, I've been working for 14 years in digital. Um, My first job out of college was directly to a digital agency, but at the time that um, Facebook didn't exist, so technically not not sure exactly what I was doing at that time. But um, I I, I basically worked on the agency side for about four to five years, and then one of my clients hired me to work in-house, which was Samsung, and then uh, Panera Card hired me to come over to the United States to help them develop their digital practices. Um, Panera Card is well known for Absolute Jameson, Big Liquor um, Company. And more recently in the last, so I spent about seven years at Panera Card uh, in several positions. Um, and, when, and then last year, I decided to move to Moet Hennessy to take over this omni-channel and CRM position. And so what are your main responsibilities? Because Director of Omnichannel and CRM sounds like a lot of work. Can you tell us <laughs> about the, like, the main focuses of, of where you spend your time? I, and it, it's it's really kind that you say that because I feel omni-channel means everything and nothing at the same time. It either means you have a lot of work or it means you have no work. <laughs> um, I think so. My responsibilities are are with are split into let's say big chunks. One of them is how to drive the omni-channel discipline by thinking about consumer decision journeys and the right touch points, the right moments to engage consumers, and the right and the right type of strategies versus uh, considering that the the, the traditional uh, proven a couple of years ago uh, marketing strategies still work. That's part of the job. And the second part, the CRM piece, which a lot of people think, well, omnichannel and CRM sound connected, but at the same time, they don't. Uh, It's because we believe that, I personally believe that omnichannel can only be true to, to, to consumer needs if we know who the consumer is and if we have enough data on them to provide them a good service. And so within CRM, I manage the, the brand life cycles with consumer relationships that, of course, tie very closely to how we impact them in, the, in an omni-channel way, in the different channels that the consumer engages with us. Fantastic. So we always do this at the start of the podcast. We ask, ask some questions about you, the person, uh, just to give a background, a bit of context to, to find out a little bit more your, about your journey. So you, you mentioned that your, your, your first job uh, straight out of uh, university was at an agency. And yes. so, I'm, so I'm curious to know, do you think an agency is a great place for a graduate to aim for? Or do you have any other advice that you would give to a a, a bright, young, motivated student who was doing all the right things? I personally would suggest that a a graduate that really wants to take marketing seriously and wants to work at a big brand or or doesn't, wants to start their own business, but want to understand um, how to engage consumers, I would say an agency is the place to start. If I went back, I would... I, I would not reject, I would not do anything different. Uh, I learned quite a bit on the agency side. It gave me all the tools from a pure implementation perspective, as well as thinking. But if you think about it, uh, I did everything from having to edit HTML because when you're on, those who work in an agency know that you play several roles. You're the account manager, but you will also uh, edit HTML and you will also be sitting with a designer till midnight to review, asset, to review assets and you'll be testing websites and you'll be planning media campaigns. It just gives you such a full breadth of all the work that uh, as a client, you eventually will instruct an agency to do uh, that I think it just makes you a much well-rounded um, marketer overall. Uh, and I see the difference personally when I, when, I, when I work with colleagues who have never been on the agency side, it is clear that there's pieces of it that they just don't understand how it works or the time that it takes or how uh, resource planning works with, on the agency side. So I personally think that a student coming out of college going to an agency is a very smart move. Um, 
also because um, the agency lifestyle is very intense. Uh, you work long hours, um, you work weekends sometimes if the client needs something launched at a specific timeline. It comes with a job, I, I don't complain. Um, some, some of those weekends were the, were the funnest weekends of my life, working with my colleagues. Um, but it's also something that requires a specific uh, time in your life to do, right? It's, it's, it's harder when you start having kids. It's harder when you start having a family. It's harder uh, when you start getting older and maybe the energy is, 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 t is not there. And bear in mind, there's a lot of people way older than me that are still on the agency and full of energy. I, I can't say I'm one of them. Um, I still have a lot of energy, but after a while on the agency side, I felt I got what I needed to know to be able to go to a to, to, to the type of brands I wanted to work in and actually deliver the level of service that they deserved. And I felt a much, much more rounded individual after doing so. What are those mindsets or things that you do that have changed that someone else could listen to this and think, you know, I, I should really try that? So a couple. Um, I think, first of all, I had a boss um, at a certain point at Pernod that, that, I mean, the expression is not new, but he enabled me to actually put it into, into practice. And I really respect it, which was, uh, don't, let, don't let perfect get in the way of good. Um, that was one of the beliefs that took me a really long time to, uh, to assimilate, implement, and, and, live, and live by. Uh, because depending on who you are, there's always a fear of failure. There's always a fear of not being able to deliver the best version of what you're trying to do. And a lot of the times there's no such thing. Um, it's a matter of putting things out there, getting consumer reactions and building on top of it. Now, of course, coming from working specifically now for fashion brands, this can be very delicate because we, there's, there's a specific standard that consumers are expecting from you as well as how the brand wants to stand. But what I definitely learned to do was much more about understanding, listen, things are rarely, if ever, going to be perfect. Uh, but they can be good. And, and good will already be a pleasant experience to the consumer. And if you continue building on top of that, you will eventually land on something that doesn't have to be perfect because it's good. It's more than good enough. It's great. And, and I think that was one of the biggest learnings that I had in life is not aim for perfection, aim for results. Which but I think, I, but I'm, I think it's so easy to say and a little part of everyone feels so happy when they hear something like <laughs> that. Don't let perfect get in the way of good because you think, brilliant, I've got less work to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> which, which is different, right? I, think it's, it's, I, I love that you said that because I think that it, it's, it's not that, right? When I say don't let perfect get, get in the way of good, it's the same thing as saying, um, I'm trying to think, I just had the expression in my mind. Um, but basically, so, uh, well, while you're thinking about that, I'll give you another uh, question. How do you know when good is good enough? What do you have a criteria or is it good feel like, you know, what perfect is, you know, what perfect would look like, but at some point, good, both, both good and perfect are two very woolly terms, but how, <laughs> how do you decide when something's good enough to go? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Now, and thank you for giving me that break because now I remember what I was going to say. The other thing I was going to say that for me is, is, is an analogy to this, to this saying is the analogy of, um, I, I, think, I, I think it might have been Dickens or it might have been, it, it was a famous writer. I don't remember his name now, but it, there was a famous writer that said, um, I, I, I wish I had time to write you a short letter, that I, but, I, it, but I didn't, so here's a, here's a long letter. Um, it, it takes more time to think through what is good enough and what is going to deliver than to try and be a perfectionist and think about everything and put everything on the table. It's actually more work to be choiceful than to be too widespread. Um, I think it's just an understanding of what work means. Being busy doesn't mean having more work. Uh, so if one of your team came up to you and you went, ah, oh, this is pretty good, are they, do they, can they like now say, to you, <laughs> right, cool, so, would... so it's good to go then? No, that, no, usually what I do, <laughs> for me, it's based on a couple of different elements, right? It has to do with, first of all, the data that you're using to define what is good and what is bad. And, and, and where does it get into subjective versus where it gets into objective? You, we, you, we have a smart, so for example, you spoke about my team. I have a very smart group of people working with me. We will be building, let's say, for example, a newsletter. Okay, for consumers. We will build it. We will use all our knowledge to build it. We will put it together. We we look at it and we say, does it look, does it have everything in it according to the knowledge that we have and previous results and data 
to make sense to the consumer. It does. Are we pandering to ourselves? No, actually this has consumer value. Great. If we spend another five days working on it, will it be fundamentally different? No. Okay, then it's probably time to put it out there and see what the consumers react to. If you love all things innovation and want to understand how brands plan to emerge stronger from the current situation, don't forget to check out Madfest London on the 11th and 12th of November. My good friend Dan at Madfest knows how to put on a cracking event and there's always plenty of amazing speakers, beer and cool people to meet. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. So we're now going to talk about your shiny new object, which is <laughs> AI and data. Couldn't be more close to home, but also couldn't be a bigger topic, really. So uh -huh. I know what I think AI and data is. So Louise, what is AI and data to you? So it, it, it and, and bear in mind, I love this question. And when you, when you first asked, I millions of things went through my head. <laughs> you know, we know shiny objects, they fly. Um, the, for me, data and AI, AI and data, in the context that I say a shiny object, is in the context of providing consumer seamless experiences and providing the same level of satisfaction and gratification that you get out of uh, the best consumer experience you've ever had across any type of consumer experience that you're having. Um, which I know sounds, again, it sounds a little bit cliche, but if you think about technology overall for the last couple of years, technology has had this habit of launching, uh, being hyped, uh, having a first use case, which is al almost always by default wrong and by default used by marketers. So it's, it's funny because I, tend, I, blame, I blame my own industry and my own uh, colleagues for, some, for, for something that, that we do, which is when the technology comes around, let's talk QR codes, right, or Bluetooth. The first use case that usually people think of is brands immediately doing campaigns around it and scan this QR code and you'll have access to our website where you learn absolutely nothing that is relevant to you, which then consumers say, okay, I was not, I'm not interested in this. I'm never going to use QR codes again. Shift a couple of years later, Snapchat shows up, uh, Facebook QR codes for Messenger show up, etc., And suddenly you're starting to see QR codes on the West, in the, in the West, of course, we're not talking about the East. The East is in a very different place with QR codes, but in the West, you suddenly start seeing people using QR codes a little bit more. The same thing applied to Bluetooth. Bluetooth 1.0 was a, it was a battery drainer and it, was, uh, it had security flaws. Bluetooth 2.0 was uh, faster, uh, safer, saves energy, etc. cetera. Um, so when I say AI and data, I say that it already exists out there. I just don't think that it's true usage and it's true massification to a point where technology and consumer are hand in hand. I just don't think we're there yet. That's it. He, um, oh, Louis, he, can you introduce your dog by name? <laughs> yeah, that's Pepper giving her opinion. She also has a, a very <laughs> data. Next week's um, guest, for sure. She's next week's guest. So, so sorry, I, I, I rambled there a little bit, which I, which I tend to do. But I think the reason why I'm obsessed with AI and data is because when you see the potential of what some companies have been able to do with it, all right, which is embedded into the, 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 the product itself in a seamless way that it became the product, um, that's what I think we need to get to. And I think major the vast majority of companies is not there. So I can give you two examples that I think do it very well. Um, Spotify, I think, does it very well, giving them some free advertising here. But if you think about the usage of Spotify, of what you listen to, and then they give you the end of your, the end of your recap, and then they have playlists that you can follow that based on their AI can determine what songs you should be following. I can tell you that every playlist that Spotify assembles for me dynamically I'd say 50% of the songs that go in it go into a personal playlist, which is a conversion rate of Spotify of 50% of anything that they recommend to me. That for me is the most beautiful intersection of AI and data. The other ones that I think have done it pretty well are, is wearables, not all of them. There's several that I could say haven't done it well, but Fitbit in particular, I think does it very well. Uh, they also know how to use your data in a very smart way to give back value and recommendations and make the data also part of the narrative that they have with the consumer. So that's the reason I'm obsessed with AI and data. It's not for the nerdy part of it. It's not for the technology part of it. It's actually for the human side of it. It's for how 
cons how as consumers, this will become the future of how we expect to behave with brands, that brands will know me, that brands will know enough about me to know that I want to be personalized or I don't want to be personalized. I want to be treated like everybody else. But it's the, it's the ability to know that and treat the consumer at that level that for me is the ultimate frontier for the majority of the brands. And any, any of the brands beyond the ones that I just mentioned and a couple of others that say that they're doing it very well, I will tell you, I personally don't believe that they are. So the examples you've given are very data centric businesses, right? You know, mm -hmm. Fitbit, uh, quantified self, I guess what they used to be called. And, uh, yep. and, and music is to some degree sort of quite measurable and, and trackable. You know, the artist is, you know, you know what genre it is, you know how long the song is with the mm -hmm. right technology, you know, the key and the structure and the, maybe even the lyric content. But do you have any examples of brands using AI and data that aren't technology businesses like, you know, a margarine band, for example, or a, <laughs> a, a, a fashion brand? Um, I don't want you to tell me the, uh, the, the inside secrets of, of your own business, but who are you looking to and taking inspiration from that aren't primarily a technology company? So oh, there's a couple of brands that I think have are doing smart things with data. But the thing is, I, I, there's very few brands outside of the tech space uh, that I think, because the other one I was going to mention is, of course, uh, Netflix, or I was going to, which is the, the the mother of them all, right? Um, other companies that I think are doing it well. I Sorry, think let, let's go back to Netflix. Why why do you see them as the mother of them all? Uh, I think Netflix was, in my very personal opinion, one of those that was at the not that they were at the forefront, but that they put it very consumer facing. That their record, that they were looking at people's habits and making decisions on what shows to air based off of that. And they were very vocal about it. Um, so when you think about, for example, the House of Cards phenomena, right? House of Cards started with uh, Kevin Spacey and his team going to the Netflix, after going to several other, uh, by the way, um, producers and, and networks, and all of them said, we need a pilot, right? A pilot costs millions of dollars to produce. And they the, the, the team of House of Cards knew that, first of all, this had already been a success, success in the UK, and two, it was a really good script. So they think we shouldn't be doing it. One episode is not going to do it justice. And so when they went to Netflix, Netflix said, hey, we ran our numbers. We know our audience. We know what they're watching. We know the type of stuff they like. Don't do a pilot. Produce the whole thing. We know this is going to be successful. Now, of course, not everything Netflix did, and we know this, has, has followed the exact same track. But the type of risk that they took by being informed by data and by what the consumers were telling them or in, indirectly, for me, Netflix was one of the first to have a, a, a concrete, provable use case that you can disrupt the previous model by using data and leveraging it to make, this, to make smart decisions. Which oh, I'm, I'm so torn on this because I, I think it's like the most clever HR bit of PR that they did, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm yet to see that how that actually worked, you know, like, did, do they actually have a creative algorithm, a, a recommendation engine, which is what it would have to be, yeah, yeah. Saying, right, you need Kevin Spacey in a politically driven drama, and someone needs to get murdered at the end of like, series one or whatever, like, I can't, well, it's I can't, a Venn diagram, or, it's a Venn diagram, right, but, but then is that Venn diagram, so different to what a good screenwriter knows anyway, right? So I'm, I'm yet to see anything on Netflix where I'm like, oh my God, it's like it was written for me because they are still following. They've, they've got like that Love Island rip off. Um, they've like, you know, the documentaries is something they're still going for. I'm telling you, man, there was no algorithm that went, you have to do a documentary about tigers in middle America. With oh no, Tiger King gets serendipity. Tiger King gets serendipity. <laughs> so I just, I'm like, I'm, it, have you seen something that I haven't seen that really gives credence and proof to what actually happened there? Or did they go, oh, we haven't got a political drama that we own. Uh, Kevin Spacey it has a huge audience. Actually, we know the script is uh, already worked in the UK, as you say, from the 1980s House yeah. of Cards. So what was the algorithmic bit there? Um, I'm skeptical, but you can- So what, the, what they said at the time, and, and bear in mind, this is of course me talking to other people who talk to other people, but what they said at the time is that they did see that there was a clear overlap between people who were interested in features that had Kevin Spacey, as well as some of the other actors that were mentioned in the cast, the type of plot and the length. 
So as you know, Netflix keeps track of every time that you stop a show, you stop watching, you pause it, everything that you do across the show, they, they identify it. And that's what they used, to, they used to make the criteria of say yes, say no to shows originally. Now, what I think happened over time is that as Netflix grew and as their audience grew, they had to diversify their offer. And now everybody plus their mother has a comedy special. I think there's a very big difference of maybe how they started versus how eventually they spread. But they started, but you can tell they're still learning from their data. I, I can give you a very interesting example for me as well, which is um, anime. I'm a big anime uh, watcher. Um, and I, most, of my, most of the time I use an app here in the US called Crunchyroll to watch anime. Um, Netflix more recently started launching anime and getting exclusives. And so I went and I went to read on it just out of curiosity. And they said they realized that anime watchers, which of course being myself one, I know this, anime watchers are, are fanatics, they're, they're loyal. And, and they don't get daunted by looking at, for example, One Piece, which is one of the longest running animes with 800 episodes. They are not daunted by this. They actually see it as a challenge and they'll be like, great, let's start with episode one and binge watch this until my kids go to college. Um, <laughs> so, and, and so what they realize is that there was a, an amazing niche in the anime audience of generating viewership because these people are very loyal. They stick to the shows, they stay and they will watch never ending anime. They jump from one anime to the other, to the other, to the other. I, I can tell you when I get on my, my, my Peloton, um, I usually put a free ride and then I'll watch three anime, three episodes of three random animes in sequence. So Netflix realized this and suddenly you are seeing them spend a lot in the US getting exclusive rights to specific animes to get people back to their on, on on their screens watching on netflix so i i see where you're i see where you're coming from i completely understand it i'm what i personally feel is that where netflix is today is not where they started but there's still things that they do that i think are completely data driven but because they had to massify and because they had to just grow i think that at a certain point data went out the door and uh the need to fill the gap in the space um kicked in that's so, opinion. so how do brands that don't have that volume of data take advantage of the applications of artificial intelligence? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, a CPG brand, yeah. for example, you know, they have one product. They may ha they may run multivariate ads. They may run uh, a, a, you know a large number of variants for personalization but fundamentally they and they haven't got that many assets to test you know there's yep. the pack there's the pack shot there's the dvr there's all a bunch of other things so isn't it hard for a uh, you know a, a more simple brand that certainly doesn't produce any content other than its own advertising to generate enough data so if some what i'm trying to get to is if someone who's listening to this who, who doesn't work for a technology brand how can they make AI work for them? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and bear in mind, I mean, MH is not a technology brand, like, right? So MH is champagne, it's liquor, it's Vuclico, It's This is a shameless plug that I put to guarantee that my, my, my company gets a couple, of their, a couple of their products in, which are fantastic products, of course. Um, the, I work for a company that is similar in the sense that we don't have a lot of data. As you might imagine, in alcohol, data is a, is a sensitive topic. Uh, we're very careful with what data we get. We're very careful with whose data we get and how we use it um, because, because of the, just the type of product that it is. Now, um, what I would tell to people, like, to people who work in the similar industries where they say, well, I'd love to do that, but I actually don't have enough data, start by mapping out, first of all, where does your product, where does your category play a role with your consumers? What are the needs that are come around it? What is the journey that consumers do when that need becomes identified to land on your product? That's one part of the equation. The second part of the equation is understanding what data do you need? And I think this, this is the part where, remember when we were talking about saying no and learning to say no? Learning to say no is also learning to say no to certain types of data and to understand that you need to prioritize some data to actually understand your consumer, and it's not gonna be everything. Because if you go after everything, first of all, the consumer is gonna wonder, <laughs> I'm gonna use a category randomly, why is this toilet paper brand asking for my address? Um, <laughs> uh, because I, I didn't order anything, so I don't understand why they need this. Um, versus understanding use cases that this toilet paper brand might have with the consumer, understanding where, this, where do consumers eventually gravitate to think about toilet paper, and based off that data, then starting to understand what types of content you can test 
right? Because giving you random, random examples, and this is us just spitballing ideas with no, with no rationale behind it. But it could be that by investigating what consumers are talking about, that they find that the most interesting piece of data that they have on consumers is how long it takes to go through a role according to the stage of life that you're in based on the number of people in your household, based on if you have kids, if you have dogs, if you're younger, if you're older. And by, and by gathering all that data from consumers, they're able to dynamically recommend people when to restock on toilet paper. It's really stupid, but it's the type of things that I, A, I believe some brands have probably already tried it, but it's, but it's the type of data that makes it relevant to the consumer. It makes it relevant to the brand. Knowing the social media handle of a consumer, why? <laughs> that's that's I think what people should always ask themselves on data is what's my data roadmap? What do I want to learn? And what am I going to do with that data? And I can give you another interesting example on it. Um, I've had this discussion several times when discussing with colleagues, even in previous jobs, a, a piece of data that was always super important for, for brands that I worked with was gender. Gender was always there. It was always at the top of the list. And I always asked, what are you going to do with this? Why is gender important? Why, are, are you going to customize your, your offerings to be so that they are more relevant to a gender than to, to the other and risk, risk doing that, uh, given that, that how, how, how that can, can fall into uh, a dangerous territory, right, uh, of sexism? Or are you going to do any type of insights? Are you going to do any type of analytics? Why Mr. or Mrs. Mass, ma matters for you? And in most of the cases, the team didn't have an answer. They said, well, analytics purposes. And I said, okay, according to your brand objectives and according to your business challenge, the gender has nothing that is going to matter to you. So let's prioritize other data that is more important to you. And it doesn't mean that down the line, we will not try to get gender to understand, to get the right analytics and statistics. I'm not saying that's not important. What I'm saying is, is it the most important thing? Probably not. And I think it's about organizations understanding that to make the, to make data valuable for them when they're data poor is to be very critical of what data will make them data relevant. And what process do you use to work that out? I've never heard that before. And I think it's a really intelligent way of approaching the type of data that you need. What's your role? What kind of data can we get? What kind of data sh should we get? So is like, is this something that anyone can apply? Is that someone else's theory or is it just common sense? It's, it's a, a, all, of the, all of the above, Tom. Uh, basically, I think that it, it's, it's, first of all, I'm a firm believer that uh, people that work for a brand and for a specific product know, should know more about their product than anybody else. And if they were hired, it's because they have a specific level of competency that is required of them. So a lot of the times what I tell, what I recommend to, to people is sit in a room, think about your consumer, think about them in exhaustion, like spend time doing it, spend time discussing it. Your assumption as a brand manager, your assumption as a product owner, your assumption as a consumer insights manager, bring different people into the room, bring people who don't work in marketing into the room who can play a little bit of the consumer role. And why am I saying this? Because a lot of the times people will say, well, we need to do a panel. Great, you need to spend a couple of thousands of dollars to get into a panel to maybe not learn exactly what you need to learn. Start with your own internal resources. Start with the people inside the building. Get them together, talk about it, understand the consumer, understand what you need to know about them, understand what is the data that you need. That is usually step number one. And to be honest, I really don't think it needs much more than a bunch of smart people who know their jobs in, in, in a room discussing it. Then it's about assumptions and making hypotheses, which is, it's the scientific met method, right? You make an hypothesis based on the data and the knowledge that you have in the room. Now, usually people at that point will ask me, well, how do you know it's right or wrong? Well, 50% of it is, act, is probably wrong. 50% of it is probably right. <laughs> That's what I say. Then it's how you test it that is going to pend this, make the pendulum swing more to being wrong than to being right or vice versa. And so get, get the team together. Get some data points jolted down that will tell you exactly what you need to know about your consumer and how you can be relevant to them. Go fishing test it with the consumers, understand, it, what, understand how they react to it, and then start building your own data off of that. And start understanding that, okay, we were completely wrong with this hypothesis, and that's fine. But I'd rather be wrong with my hypothesis on a piece of content that I post on social than on a campaign that is gonna cost me millions of dollars and run for three months. Um, and, and a lot of people will say, well, but the campaign that you're gonna run for three months, you did consumer testing, you did panels, you did focus groups, etc." Sure, that's fine, but still, if 
you spent millions of dollars and it, 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 you ran, a, it could have been very risky. You can do it in much a smaller scale, leveraging social, leveraging email, leveraging direct consumer touch points versus having to continuously develop big campaigns. Um, so sorry, there was a very long answer, but I do believe common sense is a start, is an important starting point with people. I, 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 there's an expression I love, which is common sense is so rare that it should be considered a superpower. Um, I think we completely underestimate common sense, and but there's a very big difference between un, uh, underestimating common sen common sense and living by common sense. I think there's a middle ground in between the two. Use common sense to make the first assumptions. Use data to finalize and solidify them. I think that's a brilliant place to leave it, Luis. Thank you so <laughs> much. If anyone wants to get in touch with you, how would you like them to do that? Uh, Twitter is an easy channel, uh, L underscore Spencer. Um, if you want on LinkedIn, uh, I tend to post stuff on LinkedIn. So if you want to follow me there, fantastic. Uh, if you want to chit chat, great. Um, and what makes a good outreach to you? If someone wrote to you on Twitter or LinkedIn, what, what would make you reply? Uh, that's, a <laughs> that's a really good question. Because, I mean, I think everybody, probably several of your, of your listeners uh, probably have that syndrome of people adding them on LinkedIn with a sales pitch, right? Um, which, by the way, I completely respect that. People need to make a living. And for some people, uh, their living is outreaching to both prospects and clients. Um, for you to get my attention, usually it will be by either just wanting to start a conversation, but understanding a little bit the person on the other side. So a lot of the times I get people saying, hey, uh, would love to connect. How does next Wednesday look for you? And, and, and a lot of the times I'm like, well, next Wednesday, three months from now, next Wednesday, when? <laughs> I, 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 that really did. So a part of me gets annoyed by that, which I know some, might sound a little arrogant, but it's not on purpose. It's just a matter of, I'm not going to talk to you next Wednesday, probably, because I'm, I'm, I, we're just all busy. But somebody who reaches out and say, hey, read these articles that talked about you or heard about you, et cetera. I have a product that might be interesting to your company, would love to present it. But more than anything, I would love to just get in touch and exchange ideas at a time that will work for you. Otherwise, I will just follow you and see what you're posting and maybe comment on the stuff that you post. I will say that I've engaged with more people on LinkedIn, for example, that have commented on something I posted with something that I thought was insightful. And then I went and chatted with them on the direct message and said, I love that post. I actually take the conversation out of the post. I go into chat and I say, I love that comment. Let's talk. There's a nice. Nice. Excellent. Excellent advice there. Luis, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. And please pass on our listeners' appreciation to Pepper as well for her contribution <laughs> earlier on. Thank you for All having right. me. This Cheers. is awesome. Hi. Just before you go, I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the Shiny New Object podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or whatever it's called these days, or whichever podcast provider you use. We're an indie podcast, so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels. That would just be fantastic. If you haven't got time, that's also cool. And yeah, if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also, if possible, don't forget to subscribe. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at automatedcreative.net. That's T-O-M at, uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it. Anyway, you'll work it out. Thanks so much.